Philippians chapter 1, in verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes his letter to the Christians in Philippi, and he addresses them as saints of God who are in Christ Jesus. We don't use that word with regard to identifying ourselves very often. As a matter of fact, there's an old adage that says, I'm no saint, which people usually use that meaning. They're not perfect, but biblically speaking, if one is a Christian, they are a saint. The same root word that we would use to identify those who are sanctified. You remember that Jesus in his prayer in John chapter 17 and verse 17, he said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. When Paul wrote his letter to the Christians in Corinth in chapter 6, he began talking about some of the issues of some of the Christians in that particular city and their problems they had and there was there was a lot of flesh there were a lot of fleshly problems with the Christians in Corinth and he says in verse 9 do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived neither the fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 11 he says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. That is, they were set apart. So when we talk about being saints of God, we're talking about individuals who have been set apart from worldly behavior and been set into God's kingdom. We are saints of God. Don't be ashamed to call yourself a saint. Unless, of course, there may be something in our lives that would hinder us from calling ourselves being sanctified, being set apart. But generally speaking, Christians are saints. And the word is used over and over in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 21, as Paul concludes that little letter, he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. So we understand then why we would use the title that we do today, possessing the peace of God as a saint of God. I don't know about you, but I need some peace in my life. Life can be filled with turmoil. It can be filled with troubles. It can be filled with deep concerns. And God gives us so, so many answers to help us deal with those. And this morning we're going to look at some of those from Paul's writings to the church in Philippi from the fourth chapter. But I want you to imagine just for a moment though, as we set a little bit more stage here, Paul wrote four letters from prison, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, and then his last letter that he wrote, 2 Timothy, was written from prison. The very last thing that Paul wrote was written from prison. What's amazing to me as I read his writings, Paul would tell us as a prisoner, which Paul was not in prison for being a thief. He wasn't in prison for being a murderer. He wasn't guilty of insurrection or any such crime as that. The only crime, as it were, that he committed was preaching the gospel. And it got him put in jail more than once. But Paul knew the power of the gospel. And you read the first part of this little letter to the church in Philippi that even the whole palace guard knew that his chains were in Christ. Paul did not allow himself as a prisoner in a cold, dark, damp, no doubt smelly and crowded prison to say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. If a man can be in a place like that, no telling what kind of people he was having to spend his time with and and how he might have been treated and, and mistreated, Paul could say to rejoice. And then he would also say in the next verse, let your gentleness or your kindness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. 
And in the fifth verse, he says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Then he says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. How does he do that, Paul? Through Christ Jesus. Let's analyze and apply these lessons, the words from this particular passage this morning. Think about, first of all, of finding joy in the Lord. You really cannot tell what's going on in a person's heart by looking at the expression on their face. It's not fair to judge a person's internal thoughts and feelings by an expression on their face. I remember one time when my back was giving me some trouble and one brother just thought that I wasn't happy. I said, well... I'm not unhappy, just sometimes I hurt and I'd have this little grimace on my face. So you really can't judge by looking at someone. But the question would be for us this morning, do we rejoice in the Lord? Are you happy to be a Christian? Is it something in your life that really brings you joy and happiness? Are you glad that you made that decision to become a child of God? And Paul not only says we should rejoice, but he says rejoice in the Lord always. And he he repeats it. Now, Paul, no doubt, would have done this for himself. After all, he was human. Jesus is the only person who was God in the flesh, and even he suffered in so many ways, just like we do as human beings. But Paul was not Jesus. He was a human being. And yet he had something that you and I need. Find, number one, I would say this morning, if you want to have peace with God as a saint of God, find ways to rejoice in your life. Find joy in the Lord. When I think about how I might find joy in the Lord, I have to come to the conclusion, I sinned several times, more than once. And it's my sins that caused my Lord to go to Calvary. I'm part of the reason that Jesus had to die. Somebody says, I wasn't there. No, I wasn't there. But Jesus still died for my sins, just as He did the sins of the church in Corinth when He wrote 1 Corinthians 15. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. When you think about the wages of sin being death, knowing that that death is separation from God, and being separated from God is being separated from all that is good, all that is wonderful, all that is marvelous, all that is hopeful, everything you can think of that is in the positive category of anything you know, outside of Christ, none of that exists. All the spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, are in Christ. They're all in the Lord. That gives me reasons to rejoice. A reason to be happy. Because at one time, as Paul explains it to the Christians in Rome, in Romans chapter 5, that Christ died for sinners. We were enemies of God. And through through His love and His mercy and His concern, He let His Son die for me. What did I do to earn that, Brother Steve? Not one thing. What did I do to to cause God to say, look, you know, you're just really special, Roger. I'm going to let Jesus die for you. He died for the whole world. But the fact is, He did. I, you, we were in a predicament that we could not fix ourselves. You couldn't do anything about it. You could do all the good works you'd ever want to do. But you could not pay for your sin by those good works. It took the blood of Jesus Christ to do it. When I look back in my life and you look back in yours, are there things that you're ashamed of and you would say, oh, I just wish I hadn't done that. I wish I could erase that from my life. Let me tell you something. When you become a child of God and you're washed in the blood of Jesus, it is erased. Thank God, Brother Larry said. So I'm thankful then I can rejoice because my sins have been taken care of. I can be thankful because of the current blessings in Christ. I can rejoice in that. 
All the spiritual blessings are in the heavenly places are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And I look around this room and I know there are people in here who love me. And there are people in this room that I love. And I got to visit some people while I was in Tennessee to, to go up for my aunt's funeral. And I got to go and visit with a man who was my preacher when I was, when I was young. I was probably five or six years old when he was a preacher for the congregation where we were. And I, for some reason I remember Brother John Cup. It was a blessing to see him. He's serving as an elder in the Lord's Church in the Tyner congregation in Chattanooga. That's a blessing to me to know somebody like that. I think of people that I know that when you, you know, funerals are not really pleasant, but they do bring people together, don't they? And sometimes that's the only time you'll ever see somebody, and they're so and so, and they're still faithful to the Lord. And they will say something encouraging and helpful. Now that's a blessing. That's something to rejoice about. We need that, don't we? Think of the current blessings. Because you were outside of Christ, now you're in Christ, you can pray. You can talk to God. We'll talk about that in a moment because Paul will. But think of your present blessings and rejoice in those blessings. Do they outweigh every physical problem in the world? Do they not? These physical things that come along, somebody says, my electric bill is going to be a little bit higher this month. Well, guess what? Everybody else's will too. You're not unique to that situation. But think of the spiritual blessings that continue whether the bill goes up or down. The blessings of having access to God's Word. Anytime you want to pick it up and read it. The first century church didn't have that easy of an access to it. You have prayer, you have God's Word. You have access to precious people that can help you. All you got to do is pick up the phone. Or maybe you'll run into them at the local grocery and you get to stand there and talk to a brother and sister in Christ for a few minutes and your day is going to be better. I promise you it will. And that's a blessing. Then I think of the blessings of the future. Of the the hope that the Christian has. When, When Jesus comes back to claim His own and we're resurrected, this body's changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It becomes an incorruptible body and forever I'm going to be with the Lord. And that ought to bring you some joy. I've done a lot of funerals. I say a lot, quite a few. And some funerals, I just wish they wouldn't ask me to do them. Because the person that I'm doing this for had no relationship to the Lord whatsoever. Those are hard. But I can tell you that's not true about my Aunt Vera. And I don't say that lightly. If you didn't know her, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you did, you knew she was committed to Christ. And everybody that she met knew she was committed to Christ. And she died committed to Christ. That's hopeful. That's good. Those are easy. Somebody said, how'd you preach your aunt's funeral? I said, I just talked about her. and I knew, where, I knew what her destiny was. At least I think I do. I'm not God. But I feel like I know that she went to be with the Lord. That gives us hope, people. You can die faithful to the Lord. Revelation 2.10 says you can. You be faithful unto death. And He will give you that crown of life. Now, I know we get aches and pains and things are troublesome. But we need to rejoice because of the future. The second thing Paul says though, and obviously there were were some challenges for the church in Philippi that, that there would have been some persecution because he says you let your gentleness be made known to all men. Let's back up to that prison for just a minute. Paul would have had to put that into practice. And you know what, if you go back and read the first chapter and you see that the whole palace guard knew that his chains were in Christ, Paul would not do anything to hinder that knowledge. And so he would apply this first to himself. You know anybody that might challenge your gentleness? Oh yeah, sure. But Paul has to say, you let your gentleness be made known to all men. When I read that and I think about it, now what we're aiming for when we get down to the conclusion is some peace. You see, if I rejoice in the Lord, that gives me a sense of peace. 
If I rejoice over the fact that my past sins have been forgiven, I rejoice over my current blessings, and I rejoice over a, a wonderful hope for the future, that gives me some peace. But then I have somebody that will come along and kind of kick me in the shins now and then. You know, they, they will. And, 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 you know, they may do it with words, they may do it physically. There are people that despise Christianity. They were, there were people then. Paul says, now you let your gentleness be made known to all men. It's, it's possible to do this. Is it possible to do this without a loving, caring, concerned attitude toward others? You see, if I love other people as God does, Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, and following, he says, you come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden. I'll take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Then he says, I am meek and lowly in heart. Gentle and lowly in heart. There wasn't a mean bone in the Lord's body. There were things he did that people questioned. There was nothing mean about Jesus, even in driving people out of the temple. That's, that's discipline from God. That's not mean. It's not mean to discipline a child the right way. Jesus was meek and lowly in heart. And I read that and I said, well, obviously Paul must have learned it. And how is it that he had an impact on people in prison that they knew his chains were in Christ? Because there was nothing haughty or arrogant or snippy about Paul. I've seen some snippy brethren and you run people off from the Lord when you're like that. You turn people against the church when you're that way. Paul says, no, no, you let your gentleness. Don't you want to win people to the Lord? Absolutely. So you let your gentleness be made known to all men. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 21, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod? or in love and a spirit of gentleness. In other words, it depended on their behavior, and sometimes the firmness was needed. In 2 Corinthians 10, in verse 1, Paul says, I myself am pleading with you by the meekness and general gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold, I'm going to be gentle with you. Paul enlisting the fruit of the Spirit, one of the things that he lists in Galatians 5.23 is gentleness. And then he says self-control. Against such, there is no law. It's not wrong to be gentle. I think it's odd that he would have to tell us that there's no law against that. But maybe some people think you have to be firm and hard all the time. And sometimes there is a need for firmness. But there is a need for gentleness. Proverbs 15.1 says a soft answer turns away wrath. And you run into somebody and maybe that's what he was addressing here. He doesn't specify. He just says let your gentleness be made known to all men. Huh. About my wife. You be gentle. About your children, Roger. You, you be gentle. Uh, how about your mother? Be gentle with her. What about your daddy? You be gentle gentle with him how about somebody who curses you to your face mm, I don't know about that one now do I have to be gentle with that person too oh yes what does Peter say in 1 Peter chapter 3 beginning with verse 13 and he who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats or be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to give a defense or a reason for the hope that is in you. In meekness or with meekness and fear. You mean somebody's going to challenge your Christianity? Brethren, they're not challenging your Christianity. They're challenging Almighty God. They're challenging the Lord Jesus Christ. They just take it out on us. 
And if we want to be effective, Paul says, let your gentleness be made known to all men. But what do you mean the Lord is at hand? I've done a little study on this, and Paul does not specify what he means by that. There are several things you could consider, however, if you put it in the context of someone challenging your Christianity, you need to remember that the Lord is watching. I can get that out of it. He's watching. And how was Jesus treated when he was on trial? One text says he opened not his mouth. When he could have and probably wanted to, if it had been me that wanted to say some things, Jesus, he, he wouldn't. Because his cause was greater than theirs. Amen? Our cause is greater than the cause of the world. Our cause is far more valuable Therefore, our response is critical. The way that we respond. The Lord is at hand. If we are representing the Lord, He at least is watching us. Jesus said in Matthew 28 and verse 20, as, as He sends the apostles into all the world, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I don't always know how the Lord is with me. But I know when I'm preaching the truth, I'm standing up for God's will. Jesus is, in a figurative way, is right there saying, I'm with you. I'm right with you. Because you see, it came from Him. It's His Word. It's His message. If I'm being challenged, and someone is challenging my faith, and, and, and my Irish ire gets to working, I have to bite that tongue. The Lord's watching. Watch how you respond, Roger. Be careful here. Or it could be the fact that knowing that the Lord could return at any time, as we see in Matthew 25 and the parable of the, the wise and foolish virgins, and, and the Lord came, and some were ready and some were not, but it was, in a sense, it was unexpected. We know according to Matthew 24, 36, we don't know when the Lord's coming again, so it's good for us to always. Be ready for that. But I consider what Peter is telling us that I should always be ready to give a defense for the reason of the hope that is in me. And, but I need to do it with meekness and with fear. The Lord is at hand. It could be that pray about it. Talk to God about it. Don't let it get the best of you. You think the world will get the best of you? Oh, yes. As quick as a snap of a finger, if we're not careful. But you see, the Christian is rejoicing because his or her sins have been forgiven. They're rejoicing because of the current blessings. They're rejoicing because of their hope. Somebody may come along and challenge that. Now, you be gentle because the Lord is at hand. And besides that, don't you want them to have the same thing you have? Oh, absolutely. The same forgiveness, the same blessings, and the same hope. But you know, sometimes it gets a little tougher than others. That old grinding wheel starts spinning fast. And have you ever seen an axe on a grindstone and the sparks fly? The pressure's on, and it takes pressure to cause that. And, and it generates heat. And, and, and I was watching a man do that recently, and it's amazing how in his artistic skill he can hone that edge. But sometimes pressure, if you don't do it right, you'll ruin that edge. If you do it right, it'll be sharp. And you take that finer stone and you grind it down almost to where it'll cut paper. But sometimes the pressure gets put on us and our edge gets ruined. We get hot and the edge is ruined. We start worrying. Instead of allowing the pressures of life to sharpen us, they can dull us. And anxiety kicks in too, doesn't it? We used to call it worry. Then we got this fancy word, anxious. Well, that's not really fancy. It's the word more appropriate. Paul says, you be anxious for what? Nothing. Now, wait a minute, Paul. That, that's a little bit strict, isn't it? 
Oh, oh, it is. But you be anxious for nothing. Nothing. Well, my electric bill is going to be too high this month. Well, Jesus promised in Matthew 6, if you'll seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, all these things will be added to you. And He also said, don't worry about your life, what you're going to put on, what you're going to eat. Same idea, don't worry, don't be anxious. But you don't know how people are treating me, Lord. Yes, I do. He sees everything. He knows everything that's going on. Be anxious for nothing. Well, you don't know how I feel. Well, that's kind of telling God He don't know much about us. I think He does. He made us, didn't He? Oh, He knows. Matter of fact, He says in Matthew 6, the Father knows you need these things before you even ask. He knows what our needs are. So we look at this anxiety, and Paul would say, you quit worrying and pray. Get rid of your anxiety and pray. Or maybe we should say pray and get rid of your anxiety. Well, you've got to figure out how that's going to work. I know this, if I don't pray to God in faith, the anxiety, the anxiety is not going anywhere. It's going to stay right there. But Paul says you be anxious for nothing, but in everything you make your list. This, 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 and that too, Lord. Yep, that too. Get your thumb up there too, and and, and that one, yes, get them all up there now, and all, all ten of them, whatever they are, you be anxious for nothing, but by, in, by everything, but in everything, by talking to God, by prayer. Then he says, and supplication. Supplication is making a presentation. It's the specifics of the prayer that, that you're telling God what your needs are, what, what you're feeling, what, what's hurting you, what, what's concerning you with prayer and supplication. Then you... We want to move down to the request, but Paul's, Paul's put a word in there that we need to remember with thanksgiving. Well, wait a minute, Lord. Can't we take care of all the problems first? No. No, you really can't. You've got to do prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. Then you let your request be made known to God. Because God says, now wait a minute. I know you got some problems. I know there's some challenges here. But you need to pause for a moment and think about the good things that are going on. Can you think of any good things, son? Oh, I, I probably. Oh, I could probably think of a lot. Well, now you thank me for those first, because you see, precious people, we're trying to find peace with God and inner peace with ourselves. You rejoice in always, and again rejoice. Let your gentleness be made made known to all men. The Lord is at hand, and if you're anxious. You pray about it and, and you tell me what your needs are, but don't forget to thank me for the good. Because there are so many good things that we have if we just stop and think about it. And then he says, you let your request be made known to God. Warren Wearsby says this word anxious literally means to be pulled in different directions. I can relate to that, can't you? You pull this way or that way, you're anxious, you don't know what to do, and your life is, is just unstable, and you're, and you're emotionally distraught, and, and you're irritable, or you're depressed, or, or one or the other. And Paul says, be anxious for nothing. There's not a doctor in the world that can supply what God's offering here. I'm not saying we don't ever need some medication. But there's not a doctor in the world that will give me peace in my heart like God. They're not capable. They're not God. They are limited in knowledge and their ability to help. You be anxious for nothing. nothing. Paul is saying that the Christian should not let one thing cause him to fear so as to be pulled away from his hope. And that's what it does. When you think about it, when you get so anxious 
that you don't know what to do and you wring your hands and you can't sleep and you can't eat and you can't work and you can't do this, you've not given it to God and you've removed your hope because you've told God you can't help me. Either that or you haven't asked for it. I've been there. You've been there. We've all been there. So you take a deep breath and you talk to God and don't let these things pull you away from your hope. Keep your eyes, as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him because ultimately you'll spend eternity with Him if we're faithful. But what then will happen? Well, you, you, you're thankful. You let your request be made known to God. And you sit around and wait and see what happens. That is not what Paul said. Now, we know God doesn't do everything like that. It could be six months before you get the answer. It could be six years before you get the answer. There are some things God may never answer in an affirmative way because God's not going to manipulate the world for me. He's not going to do that. But He will give me peace. Because if I will rejoice in the Lord always, if I let my gentleness be made known to all, I love other people and I treat them the way that I should and I respond the way that God says to with meekness and fear. I'm not ashamed, but I'll be meek. And I, when I'm anxious, I'll talk to God. I'll be thankful. And I'll say, now Lord, this is what I need. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now the last part is the question that you and I have to answer. Do we believe that? Do we really believe that God will give us peace? I mentioned Brother John Cup a little earlier. And, and I was telling, we were talking about this very text last Sunday evening. Wednesday evening it was. And, and I'm not sure how old Brother John is, but if he was a, a, an adult preacher when I was five or six, he's very easily old enough to be my father. He says, it took me years to understand what the peace that passes all understanding means. And I said, I'm going to remember that, Brother John, because there may be some young Christians, they don't understand that yet, and it would give you hope to pass that information along just because you don't understand the peace that passes all understanding doesn't mean that you never will. Because you can. But I know one thing. I know that, that we have peace with God through, through Christ Jesus. That's Romans 5 and verse 1. I understand that. That, that, that there's this peace that comes about between God and us when we become Christians. The sin problem is removed and we're in a faithful, peaceful relationship with Him. But what Paul's talking about are feelings here, our emotions, our confidence. And if I've given it to God, Lord, here it is. I'm thankful oh i'm so thankful for all these things but these things are troubling me let me let me give those to you and i know this much if i give it to him and i let him have it i'm going to get some peace i'm not carrying that burden anymore i've given it to god and it may flare up again and I may become John Cup's age before I understand it. I may never fully understand it. But I know that if, if I give it to Him. Have you ever been through an experience that was one of the most difficult things in your life? And you have to say, Father, this is the hardest thing I've ever dealt with. And he can look down and he can listen and say, if he would speak, he'd say, give it to me. I don't know if I can. Give it to me anyway. Do I have to give you all of it? Yes, son, you do. You have to give him all of it. And to me, that's where the peace that surpasses all understanding comes. 
give him all of it. That doesn't mean that we ignore the will of God. It doesn't mean that we seek to settle our problems our own ways. It doesn't mean we run from God and we we forsake Him in one way or another. All those things obviously would be in place because you cannot rejoice in the Lord always and not spend time with Him. So obviously He understands that we're going to maintain to the best of our ability a daily relationship with Him. We're going to be with the saints and we're going to spend time with Christian people and we're going to try to avoid those things in life that would draw us away from God. But those things that trouble us, give them all to me, God says. And I truly believe That if we do, we will have a peace that we don't understand. And precious people, we don't have to understand it because the Bible says it surpasses all understanding anyway. That kind of puts God on the level where He belongs. I can handle it. You let me give you peace and I will. So that's the lesson this morning. If you're not a child of God, if you've never come to God Come to the Lord in faith, believing Jesus is the Son of God, believing He died on the cross for your sins, understanding that you need to repent of your sins. In Luke 13, verse 3, the Lord would tell us, and that we were baptized for the remission of our sins, as was explained in Acts chapter 2 to those people on Pentecost. The Lord added those people to the one and only church that we read about in the New Testament. It belongs to the Lord. And in that body, you're around other people of like precious faith who are doing, hopefully doing their best to get to heaven. But sometimes we don't do our best and we forsake God. We push Him out. Or we put Him on a shelf. Or we'll say, I can handle this by myself, Lord. And Paul says through these passages today, no, you can't. You're not able But if you'll give it to me and you give it to me on my terms, I'll take care of it. And sometimes it's just a confession of sin. Confess it. Get things right with me and you'll have some peace. I don't know about you precious people, but I need it. And I want it. Do you? Do you want peace from God and need it this morning? Then the opportunity is yours even now as we stand and as we sing.